And so December 6th, a torso was found. December 6th, we get a call from Jasmine County Sheriff's Office that a human torso has now washed up on the Jasmine County side of the Kentucky River. And it's the torso from about uh, the bottom of the rib cage, no head, no arms. So you have down to about the shoulders uh, and from the neck down just below the breastbone. So that's what washes up. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast, The Murder of Goldie Massey, Part 4. So we started researching it because Steve said, no, I think there's new. And back in the day, there's new stuff. Right. Right. And and I'd seen this. I'd seen them rehydrate fingers before, you know, injecting them with water. But but what you have to understand is this this arm had been in water the whole time. Right. So it was um, if you've ever seen like when you get dish pan hands. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they said we just, you know, it's not good enough. So we were like, okay, we'll take you at your word. Yeah. We'll- but something interesting that we did find out about where it was severed was. Yeah. Well, not at that point. We knew that it had been severed. Um, and Cleanly, though. Yeah. So actually the medical examiner at that point had ruled the, that arm had was a subject of a, they had ruled it as a homicide. Okay. Based upon discovery facts what they saw in it so they had they had knew that an arm couldn't exist in the condition that it was in without as being a result of a homicide and it goes back to the whole coroner's office criminal side of it coroner's office can only be homicide homicide suicide accident um natural or other for so listeners so figure, that's not a murder fig, it's right. a homicide. yeah figure out a figure out a category to throw it in and you throw it in that category. So homicide fits. So that's, that's how that medical examiner's report, uh, read. So that, that's, so that could be had. from a boat propeller, right? Right. We don't know what the state of the sever is at that point. We know that it was real to homicide. So Steve is still not on this case. No. So no. I have, st- <laughs> I still have other detectives working at that are next up. And, so a few days go by. December sixth is when the female upper human torso. Yeah, Nothing so was done in between because we're communicating with the Louisville uh, State Medical Examiner's Office trying to get fingerprints from this. And so December sixth, a torso was found. December sixth, we get a call from Jasmine County Sheriff's Office that a human torso has now washed up on the Jasmine County side of the Kentucky River, and it's the torso from about. Uh, the bottom of the rib cage, no head, no arms. So you have down to about the shoulders uh, and from the neck down just below the breastbone. So that's what washes up hmm. uh, on the on the. Which is curious, right, Dave? So if you remember when I first started and you were already and, there, landfill. Linda. Right? Yeah. Perfect example. That's exactly what it looked like, except for she had a little bit more toward the upper, abdomen. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, yep. and that's exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, what's unique about that too, is that's actually a, a pretty small part of a torso. So was it pretty intact? Yeah, it was. And we talked about this earlier. I have all of this in my case file, obviously mm-hmm. fairly gruesome pictures, but for me working it again, going back to my corners office, just intriguing. Right. Sure. I mean, just, What's going to lead you to fact? Absolutely, and and, and what yeah. was important about it is it it appeared that those limbs, the head had been severed, the arms had been severed, so it, it was kind of leaning us in a direction. You know what I mean? Because now we had an we had a left had an arm, arm in Lockport. Now we have a torso an upper missing torso, an arm, which we believe to be female. Mm-hmm. Now, Doctor Bill Ralston, who we took to. He was in Frankfurt at the time. He, I think he's now the chief medical examiner's office in Kentucky, but he was working out of Frankfurt at the time. He was. We took it up to him. Well, the coroner's office took it up to him. He wasn't convinced at that time that it was 
female, um, but in the end, he felt more like female because it was in it was in fairly poor shape. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was just super, super. Who found that? Another fisherman? I no. believe it was another fisherman or somebody that was down there. I, was it the ferry? was it the fisherman there and someone just that was out on Lockport? It was one yes. or the other, but I remember a fisherman found one of the parts. Right. Any idea just where in Jessamine County the tour just was? below the locks, just below, just the below the locks, Lock nine, right? Lock yeah, nine. past uh, Valley View down there. Wow. Yeah, okay. not far from my house. Yeah, I was going to say, had, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. It would have to yeah. be. Yeah. So this, when this was found, it didn't contain breast. It was just kind of in a, a real poor shape. Yeah, uh, it appeared female, but you c- you couldn't assume at that point. You know what I mean? We, I mean, Doctor Rawson wasn't comfortable in saying. 100% oh, it, female. Yeah. Certainly leaning that way, mm-hmm. but because we didn't have head, we didn't mm-hmm. have arms or anything like that, he, he couldn't say for certain. Yeah, they'll stay on the fence on something like that till they're 100%. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, and it's probably good for the listeners because you describe a little the breastbone and everything. And right. it's like, no, these things are more difficult. To, they're yeah. not, uh, they don't look like mannequins usually, especially if time's gotten a hold of them. So. So I'd like to describe the detective's point of view. You, the listeners might think, yes, all right, yes, we found Goldie. No. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> There's a ton of work. We have an arm in Henry County. We have a torso in Jesmond County. How many missing people across the state are there at one point? That is so true. Uh, we did the uh, case of uh, Michael Gorley, uh, just mm-hmm. south of here missing, and uh, just about a week ago, some human remains were found in Garrett County or in Crab Orchard, mm-hmm. and and in the, in the fur, and that's relatively close to where yes. he was missing from. And uh, and I and immediately I think that uh, the family mm-hmm. they they, they latch onto that too. Maybe. And but then you start realizing too, and you learn that there's a lot of adult missing people Absolutely. from in that general area too. Mm-hmm. So while we hope maybe it has a resolution for the the Gorley family, it the reality not. of it is is who knows. Right. And, and, and for us, and for us, really, I mean, you're talking about, you're talking 120 miles yes. away from that's Lexington. A good so you know, logic start, that's a long way to yeah, go. It's a long way to go, but it's both in the river, yeah. right? I mean, it, this isn't like one on a piece on of a property right. and, yes. and, and right. the other True. one. Is so, in the river. so both are in the river. So we, we just are hopeful. So here's, yeah. So liaisoning is very important in our line of work. So in the meantime, I'm still talking with the Louisville Medical Examiner's Office saying, okay, have, what have you tried to get these fingerprints? What have you done? And luckily on my birthday, December 10th, they call and say, hey, we've got prints. Well, I think, I think back up to that, though, is when we took the torso to Dr. Ralston, mm-hmm. he, he immediately did DNA between the arm in the torso nice. and matched it. Oh. So we knew at that point the torso and the arm match. So we're like, gosh, we need that fingerprint. You think about uh, back before DNA where you'd be, I mean, right. I oh, mean, oh no, it would have, it yeah. well, we kind of lived it. So yeah. I mean, it, no, uh, I, I mean, back when mitochondria was just becoming a thing and touched <laughs> right. DNA, where you had to have a quarter size of blood. Exactly. To get an analysis. Yeah. And, and that, that would just DNA tell you. That'll never happen. You'll have phones that flip and you can talk on them. I mean, <laughs> crazy stuff like that. It. Uh, I'll carry a bag and a phone or a phone in a bag. I I even yeah. found out that there's rapid DNA now, and that's even past me. So oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I'm gonna start talking like you guys. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. But it, it, but there again, what a blessing in the idea that that's powerful stuff. Right Absolutely. There. And yeah. and so Dr. Rawson, being the the whiz that he is, I mean he he was like, oh, we have this down here. We have this arm. We have this torso. There could be something going on here. So he compares the two and and uh through through some of the um samples that were taken was able to confirm that those two body parts went together good for him wow. can you imagine yeah. and, and could be not even just a deal if somebody didn't even do that yeah i mean and that's not unbelievable wouldn't mean that they were lazy or anything no. but but if somebody just didn't make that comparison just putting yeah. two to two together yeah so i remember my first show here it's so important that I don't know how many people you've had on here, how many detectives, but it's so important to make the point that if you have a detective on this show, I hope you kick them out your door when they say, I, I solved this. Oh, yes. <laughs> so already we have Jasmine County sheriffs helping us. We have Louisville state medical examiners. We have Frankfurt state medical examiners. We have Henry County sheriff and for 
corner helping us. Yeah. This is a phenomenal case. Mm-hmm. Everybody's working it. And Everybody, Jasmine County Corner that we actually did an interview yeah, with. Yeah, Michael 100%. Hughes helped us out. Fantastic. I mean, eventually yeah. we'll have the, yeah. the folks down, the forensic and the yeah. down at UT at the body mm-hmm. farm helping us out. So We're the ones that have to testify. But everybody <laughs> right. else is so wonderful, and you can't do it without them. Yeah. Some of us I know I say that every time I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. Some of us are up there for a long time. Some of us aren't. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is a story for another time. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Um, so on my birthday, I contact the, the uh, Louisville Medical Examiner's Office, and they proceed to tell me that they have come up and Steve. We had talked to him off and on about, hey, try this. We've, I did Google. He did Google. He's experienced. Steve experienced this. It suggested, hey, he's collected bodies from the water, being a mm-hmm. coroner. This is what he recommends, and lo and behold, they did get a fingerprint off of the arm. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were actually able to get a bunch of prints. If I remember in looking at some of the stuff that we got back from Keith Dollinger at the KSB lab, they were able to get some really good prints. Um, you know how they, how they managed it? I think what they actually did is they, they and not to be gruesome um, to, your, to your audience, but is- they actually removed the hand sure. from the arm. That way they could roll it better to make better prints. Okay. And, yeah. and what I they mean, did, what they let the, they let the arm kind of dry. Right. Because it had been in water for so long. They let the arm, they let the arm dry and then they rehydrated the, the tips of the finger okay. to make them more, um, Malleable, mm-hmm. I think, is the word that you use there. So, so they're, they're they have some stiffness to it, so you can get some ridge detail uh-huh. when they roll the print. So yeah. they were they they were successful in getting prints, and and sure enough, they came back and told us, "Hey, that arm is Goldie Massey's arm," and they're we knew by that arm Massey. being Goldie Massey's arm, that torso that was torso Goldie was. Massey's. But torso. but how if a person had she, how were you able to obtain that those were her prints? Had she ever had a record of some sort? Because if you don't have a record. You're not going to know whose prints those are. Correct. So we talked about Nibin earlier, and it's finger, it's shell casing fingerprints. There's APHIS out there, and that's the automated fingerprint indexing system, which if you've ever had your prints taken or if you've ever been in trouble, you're in it. So that's that's how, that's how we had Goldie's fingerprints is because she was because already she had been in, trouble. in APHIS. She had written bad checks in right. Bourbon County. And there we go. They fingerprint everybody in Bourbon County. When you enter, which is a minor offense, right? Right, I mean, yeah, but, right. But maybe, maybe as a blessing now, is that? Uh, that otherwise, you had they wouldn't that. have known if she That's hadn't it. been. One hundred percent. Yeah, right. One hundred percent. I mean, if she had never been arrested or never in her fingerprints, we wouldn't have known who's have those, known. whose hand that went to. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was my birthday gift. That was a great yeah. birthday. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday! Thank, yeah. thank you. I think I think well, it was only sixty-five at that yeah. birthday. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I showed you my Civil War buttons. <laughs> I was brought them into work. Exactly. <laughs> he, he shot with a musket. <laughs> <laughs> so from this point, once we get the fingerprints and identify that they are Goldie Massey's, officially, I'm proud to announce. Steve McCowan <laughs> is the lead on the homicide of Goldie again. Massey. Oh. So how did that happen? I mean, you dodged that bullet so many times. I had, had, it was just. I, it was his turn. Yeah, it was, I was up. And we had we had went all the way through the rotation from when I initially, we went out and, and interviewed Paris in the very beginning at his place. And we had went through so many homicides that occurred. I was back to the top and. Here we are. Here we are. Goldie's Goldie's arm matched her torso. Her upper, upper torso. So well, I was during up. this time, was there any word from Zach or Paris? Zach was in the jail, still, still in Burby mm-hmm. County Jail, at, at still. And, and months and, later, and we really hadn't. I mean, we hadn't made contact with Paris. We were we were doing our thing on the side. You know, we were we were adding all these things up as they were coming in. I mean, so obviously, since the encounter in the doorway, you hadn't gone back to see him again. Nope. No. Wow. No, I hadn't talked to him. Remember, we still have several other suspects we have to eliminate. We have Zach, right? We have the people that she owes money to. Well, in the meantime, while we're waiting for the torso and the fingerprints to come through, actually, the people that she stole money from have been calling me and telling me she may be on the run. She owes me this much amount. She may be on the run, uh, an older lady that... When I got the cell phone records from Goldie Massey, that very same day on the 21st, she had probably called her seven times because Goldie was supposed to show up at her home to go ahead and do her her quarterly taxes, and she never showed up. So the older lady, sweetest pie from Bourbon County, 
said, well, I'm going to have to file because she stole enough money from me. I just can't take the loss. So she calls financial crimes at the Lexington Police Department and files charges. In the meantime, Steve and I are still working on the homicide of Goldie Massey. It's officially a homicide. And I think an important part of that and what Chris touched on there initially are those cell phone records. So, right, we get the cell phone records back, and what we get back with that are her locations and numbers called. So, right, what do we want to do? We want to look at those phone numbers as to who are the last people that called her because those are the last people that talked to her. So we start going through her call log and start identifying those numbers as to people um, that, that had talked to her recently. So we knew that we want to talk to those people. Um, and that's kind of what we were doing in the meantime is going out, identifying the numbers, identifying the people, and going out and saying, hey, why'd you call Massey on this date? Hey, why'd you call Massey on this date? Real detective what, what, work. Yeah, what, yeah. What, yeah. What, yeah, why were you trying to get a hold of Goldie for? Um, you know, just just to shore that end up, you know, because you think about somebody that talked to him the last time, you're like, hmm, that last person that talks to somebody is pretty good. You know, that's somebody you want to talk to. Well, so you're closing and, and, loops, right? Yeah, and because right. we, we were going, absolutely, and we were going back a few days um, to talk to the, you know, talk to the appropriate people in the last days before we knew that she had gone missing. Right. And along with those phone calls, we still have the last people who are calling her is Zach looking for her because he needs a babysitter and Paris. Yeah. Because he was coming to Cynthiana to pick her up. According to him, he was yeah. coming to Cynthiana. Yeah. So I didn't get to go ahead and celebrate like I wanted to, yes. you know, strippers, balloons, champagne. Right, whole- right exactly. I, uh, Steve and I make a plan that we're going to have to get a search warrant done. So I go home and then Steve and I meet early the next morning and we write up a search warrant. And for the listeners that and, uh, many of the listeners that I've learned on your podcast, they, they listen, they were faithful. But if they're new, a search warrant just doesn't happen within an hour and you can go get a judge to sign it. It takes several hours to put the probable cause why you need that search warrant and the basis of everything you've done in the investigation thus far. And then, go ahead. And I think part of the search warrant is what are we looking for? What are you? What are we looking for? What if, What do we have? We have an arm that's severed. We have a torso that's severed. We have a statement from a guy whose house that we're going to go search who wouldn't let us in uh, that had some injuries. So what are we looking for? We're looking for blood. We're looking for tools. We're looking for, you know, the things that would add up in the murder that we're investigating. We're not we're not looking for computers. You know, we're not looking for cell phones. We're looking for things yeah. that we're not looking instruments for love letters. Job, right? Correct. We're not yeah. looking for and that's the great thing. It was a minimal amount of things we can narrow it down to. We're not looking for documentation that says I hate you, right? Because right. we didn't have a long term relationship. Tarts, history right? binding you know i mean because you think Missing about it carpet. if you right. cut someone up there's going to be a lot of blood well that and any other body fluid i mean right. there's, there's tons in there right absolutely and, yeah and the other thing too about uh again kind of like we talked about when you're standing in front of a door and he's got arm's length and you can see inside the door again if you get into a house that has those limited things and you stumble across those other things then you can get those through serendipity or cut a second search warrant mm-hmm. based on the defining of them. So it's it's a stair-stepped way in there. But that's a really good explanation, though, of how you limit yourself on the scope of what you can go I, into. Absolutely. And I was always taught by these guys and by, by Chris and Bill and Rob and, and Matt and those guys, that, those four corners are what – that's your career. You know, you present those four corners of that paper to a judge. I mean, you're you have to be certain on that. So right. we were – we talked about it, Chris and I did, before we even started writing it on how we were going to prepare this and what we're really going to be looking for, what we're going to be focused on. And I'm not going to say it really hurt us. Actually, I think in the end, when we did it, I think that we thought we hurt ourselves. But initially, um, we kind of limited what we were looking for. We did. Receipts to show that yeah. they went to the bar. But, I, we go. but I think as we go along and as you'll hear – it actually helped us to get back in there. Um, His first interview was phenomenal to help us get back in there. Right. Yeah. And we'll get into that. And and what we found initially in the initial search warrant and what we were just looking for limited, you know, we, again, we weren't, 
We weren't looking for computers and 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 digital information and things of that nature. We were looking for uh, tools, tarps, blood, biological, and, and it would be normal for her clothes to be there, right? They were yeah. dating, mm-hmm. right? They're adults. They're gonna they're gonna be dating, so. A toothbrush is not going to help us, no, right? right. No, not, we're, nothing like that. Yeah, and so we, we, Chris and I sat and we talked about it. What do we, how, how do we need to go about this? And we thought that was the best way to do is be limited in the scope on what we had, um, and and that's kind of what we did, right? So once we typed up the search warrant that very next morning, uh, Steve and I, and it was just this was a case. I will say, it was well thought out, well planned, and every portion of this investigation was discussed as a chess game. Yeah, we... All right, we're getting a search warrant. How are we going to get Paris out of the house to talk to us because he barely wanted to talk to us standing at the door, right? right? How, do, how do we get him to headquarters where we can actually sit down and talk to him because if he says, I don't want to go, That's he, he don't have to up, go. Right, he, exactly. can he can sit, sit on the his, curb his and watch apartment. us search his apartment. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, we were we were really game planning. How in the hell, Scoon, how are we going to get him to come down? Yeah, I'm sure that included the Pike County affiliation. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we started <laughs> looking. Wrong with that. But what was no. important, what we found was. Is we did he a had, history he, on him. Yeah. So we did a history on him and found that he had pawned a bunch of things. And it actually, he had filed a, a um, police report for shit that had, stuff that had gotten stolen from him recently mm-hmm. and we knew one of the detectives back you, in you property say it was shit <laughs> yeah. and there was a reason he was saying it was stolen from him yeah. i think yeah. and, and there was a report on file by one of the detectives back in property crimes were like we'll use that oh, we'll be right. like hey let's come down and talk about this stolen shit that's been you you're, you're wanting recovered there we go and, and that's we'll, exactly and that was kind of the ruse that we used which came up in a suppression issue uh, later on down the road, but you probably survived it. We did. We yeah. did. Yeah, we did. of course. Um, because but, it's legal. but but we had to have come up with a way to say, "Hey, Paris, you need to come and talk to us." And if he said no, we'd be like, "Well, you probably want to because you you have some interest in this, right?" Right. We may have some leads on some of the stuff Your that you were stuff that was gone reported so a couple right. weeks ago. So that's right. so he agreed to come down once we knocked on his door. He answered his door. It was at evening time, actually. There was, did he, did he look dark. at you all like, get no, it, back? And no. Ag- and again. No, he did not. And again, we were, we we planned this out. We didn't want everybody there. You know, we didn't bring a team of people that was nope. going to do. It was me, just Steve me, and I. Me and Chris went to the door said, hey, Paris, you want to come down? We've got this. And he agreed. So once he left, we were like, go. <laughs> Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims, so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about our presenters, and a link to the official Murder Police Podcast merch store where you can purchase a huge variety of Murder Police Podcast swag. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed caption for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. Make sure you set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.